Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, give him praise. We praise you, Father. We magnify. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. You deserve all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. Praise your Father. Woo! Good to see everyone this evening. You may be seated. Well, let's just start this year off right. Praise the Lord. I mean, we're already four days in. You know, I've already started mine right. <laughs> But praise God, this is our first service of 2024, and I'm pretty excited about the things that the Lord is going to speak to us about. Praise God. Thank you for those that are joining us online. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 in the Good News Translation. And I just want to start with this verse before we get over into what I believe the Spirit of God wants us to talk about. Um, Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. This year is going to be a year of much, much more. Amen. I really believe that all my heart. And so we're going to talk about how we're going to conduct, or conduct ourselves and how to apprehend this thing that God spoke to us about. Now it says, man, that's kind of big, huh? Praise the Lord. I guess that's good. <laughs> this just looks so much different than the because we just changed it. That's why I was kind of surprised. To him <laughs> who by means of his power, look at that, by his power working in us is able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of. Now let's put this up in the Amplified Classic. Let's get a broader picture of how is God going to bless us much, much more than we can ask or think. Now look what it says in the Amplified Classic. Now to him who, by in consequence of the action of his power, we might talk about that on Sunday about the different Greek words used for the word power in the New Testament. Uh, this one here is talking about energy. There's a divine energy, just like, you know, there's energy flowing behind this sheetrock. There's energy flowing in, in these devices that we're using. And if you and I will come in contact with that energy that's in the form of an outlet, you know, we're going to give. Because it's a lot more powerful than we are. But we found a way to harness it and able to use it for our advantage, you see. And so when a lot of times when it talks about the power of God, it's always flowing, it's always moving. You can always connect to it at any given time, right? But there are things that govern the power, and we have to properly connect to the power of God, and we can do that. And so when it's talking about in consequence of action of his power, I'm expecting God's ability to show up in our lives like never before to accomplish our dreams, things we're looking for him to do, and it's going to take the power of God to do it. So we ought to be known as the power bunch. Yeah. Amen. I mean, think about it. Yeah. We need power. I mean, why would, you, why would you try to serve God without power? I mean, right. you, you frustrate the whole thing. You just can't do it. You'll go back living the way you were living before you said yes to Jesus. That's why the power shows up in our life, causing us to be stable and also causing us to live above the beggarly elements and rudiments of this world. That's what Galatians says. Now it says, uh, his power that is at work on the inside of us. Say, his power is working in me. His power is working in me. And it's working in me mightily. It's working in me mightily. Now let's see what it says. Is able to carry out his purpose and to do super abundantly, far over and above. That's much more. Far over and above all that we can dare at. Dare ask or think. So when God's going to show up, no, I'll mention it in a moment. Let me read this. Dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. Now that's powerful. But you got to qualify. And the way you qualify is you're going to have to ask. 
No one's asking. He can't do nothing with it. He can't do anything with that. You're going to have to think on a whole nother level. Prayers. You're going to have to be a person of prayer. You're going to have to be a person that desires some things. You're going to have to begin to think thoughts that are far over than what you've been thinking before. You're going to have to expect, that's what hopes me, expect God to show up and to show out like never before. And then it says dreams. You and I are going to have to dream on a whole other level. Now, we can't allow ourselves to get distracted by kids screaming in the back. Now, I had to say that because I'm not playing games in 2024. Because this is critical and this is important for us to get a hold of. You understand what I'm saying? We got to look. Kids cry. They scream. They act up. They're going to do what they're going to do. But we're adults here. And the word of God is being administered to us, and we have to focus and get this word. You understand what I'm saying here? All right, now let's go back. <laughs> now, this is serious. I'm serious about this because God's been speaking through a lot of men and women of God about this being a year much, much more. Yeah. Today, I said, now, when we get that prophecy, when we, well, I, was, I knew when we got it. We got a prophecy in the year 2000. Matter of fact, it was... What day was that on the, when we got that? Well, it, it was a first year of marriage, and we had gone to a a, 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 retreat. a retreat. It was a, a, leaders a leaders retreat, staff retreat, and we had gotten a prophecy, which I'm not going to go into detail about, but I'm just bringing it up for this point. Now, that was in the year 2000. Here, 24 years later, and we hadn't really seen the fruition of that prophecy at all. And so Tadas and I decided to go to uh, Texarkana, which you knew we were in a meeting Sunday night. Then we decided to hang back for a couple of days because we wanted to spend some time with some people that we say we're going to spend some time with. And this is what I'm talking about. This is, these are these type of things, what I'm talking about. The, you you got to be able to be led by the Spirit of God and do what he's telling you to do because this is part of it. You can't just be thinking natural, well, I'm just go and just, you know, you, you got to, what is the purpose? Why am I going? Do I need to stay a couple of more days? Because it didn't probably didn't make sense to stay a couple of days because the meeting was on Sunday night. Should have come back on Monday. You understand? Other, unless the Holy Ghost tell you to hang back. And so we're spending time with, with, with uh, these couples that we, two different couples, and the last night we were there, we spent some time with a couple, and uh, it's not important to mention who it was. But um, we're sitting there talking over dinner and things like that, and they decided let's get up and go in the little room or whatever. We're sitting there. And this person begins to talk and share the exact same thing. This is what I'm saying. The exact same thing that the Holy Ghost said to me on November the 15th in the bed. Am I telling the truth? Use the same terminology and begin to say something to us, and this is it. This year is going to be a year of much, much more for you as a couple. You're getting ready to walk in some things. But see, that's one of the things the Holy Ghost said to me. So you're going to begin to walk in some things, Think basically things you've been believing God for a long time, and then begin to bring up the whole idea of wealth without going into details, because I got permission to share this, what I'm getting ready to share right now. This person shared with us how they were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. But they were just believing God to get out of debt because the word of the Lord. Was, now, Jared knows I'm not making this up. Friday, I'm, I'm, I know I'm jumping in and out. Friday night, I did a home meeting. You, you and Sister Katie were there. Remember when I talked about Luke chapter 5, and I talked about that harvest and why God did that to Peter. And remember, the word was specific. I did this to position you to harvest men. God's wanting, wanting to bless our socks off to get us in the position so we can harvest. You follow what I'm saying? See, people don't understand why the increase comes. But a lot of times, if you don't understand that, when the increase comes, you'll hock yourself up. You'll go further in the debt with the increase and realize, how did I get here? I'll tell you how you got there. You weren't harvest-minded. You weren't harvest-minded. You weren't steward-minded, right? And so... The Lord spoke to this person and said, I'm going to get you out of debt so I can position you to be a harvester. Isn't that basically what the, what the Holy Ghost said? So you can harvest, right? Think about it. If you had no, if you're out of debt and, you're, and you were highly blessed, 
you become instantly a distribution center for the Lord. He can tell you, give $5,000 over here, give a $10,000 over here, and you don't blink. Right? So they were doing what they knew to do, like many of you, like me, like, me, like, like a lot of us in this room, like a lot of people watching online, just sowing seed, believing God to get out of debt. And then one day a gentleman walked up to them and handed them a million-dollar check. And that person shared that with us and said, I, I feel like I need to share this with you because this is where you're going. See, but see, this is what we, what we need to understand what I'm getting ready to say here. It's nothing for God to send one person to write you a million dollar, two million dollar check because he knows who has it. It's nothing for him to do that. But you got to get to the place where you're able to think that. That's why I brought that up. Because Ephesians 3 says he's going to do far much more than what you can think. Yeah. See, he's going to have to increase your capacity in your imagination and your thinking. If you can't think this can happen, it will not happen to you. Yeah, that's right. yeah. that's right. If you don't think he can come give you 10,000 just like that, you, you, can't get, you can't receive 10. <clears throat> Some people in this room only have $500 capacity. $1,000, $10,000. Fifteen thousand. I'm talking about at one time. This is the kind of stuff the Holy Ghost is talking to us about. Because there's nothing for God to do that. It's just zeros. <laughs> I mean, we have to think like it's just it's just it's just money that really means nothing. Because it has pictures of dead people on it. But it's a tool to be used to get the will of God done. Matter of fact, Jesus speaking, he said it's the least thing in the kingdom of God according to Luke 16 that God will commit to your trust. And he says if you've been unfaithful with that, who will commit to your trust? Now I'm reading that one time and the Holy Ghost said to me, you have a trust fund that only can be accessed by qualification. Because he brought up the word trust which means everybody in this room, before the foundation of the world, you're already stinking wealthy, but will you access the wealth? It's called the unsearchable riches of Christ. And the way you qualify is with the lesser thing in the kingdom of God, which is money. Because think about it. If money, if money is able to get a grip of you and dictate to you what you can and cannot do, you can't handle the power. You can't handle the gifts of the Spirit like you should. You can't handle people's lives like you should because money will always trip you up. It's called the spirit of mammon. Now, oh me, oh my, I mean, you know, but, but it's simply the truth. So we're going to have to get over some things. We're going to have to hurdle over some things. We're going to have to get to the place where he says, God, it's just zeros. Just zeros. Doesn't matter where your job is, don't matter where you work or don't work. It requires you to use your faith. What's working in you? We ain't talking about McDonald's working in you. We ain't talking about Chick-fil-A working in you. We're not talking about Home Depot or, or NASA. That, that's not, he's not blessing us according to that power. Matter of fact, that power is, is really in, is none in comparison to the power I'm talking about. So we're going to have to get beyond ourselves so we can go beyond ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? We're going to have to, we're going to leave some things behind in our thinking. We're going to have, I mean, we're living in the greatest hour of human history. I mean, the harvest is ready. But how are you going to harvest them? You need some tools. You need some harvesting tools. Jesus said so. He said when the harvest is ready, that person throws in the sickle. He's the one that brought up a tool. And according to what he said, that's what he did to Peter in Luke chapter 5. Peter was wondering, how, why did you give me so many fish? He said, I did it. He said, if I did it, he said, I did it. From henceforth, you should be fishers of men. That's why he did it. He said, I put these tools in your hand, a fish, so you can go trade with them to get you in the place to where you can travel with me for three and a half years. And we know he lived off of that, not just him, but him and his partners. Because Peter had a wife. He had a family. And he was so blessed 
that he didn't have to be concerned about his own personal life. Did you get what I just said? He demonstrated to Peter what he talked to us about in Matthew chapter 6. Why worry about your food? Why worry about your clothes, your shelter, your housing, money? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. See, he got Peter to shift and be kingdom minded. And when he did, he couldn't even bring all that harvest in by himself. He had to beckon unto his partners. That's why I taught what I taught on, on, on Sunday, that it, it's equal partnership. All of us got our hands on the net because that's how God wants to do it. Now, uh, praise the Lord. Now, where do I want to go? Let's go to Mark 10. Mark chapter 10. Look at verse, uh, let's look at verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, came to him saying, Master, we would that you should do for us what shall, whatsoever we shall desi desire. Did you hear what they just said? You see how they're talking to Jesus? And Jesus said to them, what would you that I should do for you? Now put that up in the NIV. I don't know what it says. I think it's a little bit clearer. That's what we're looking for. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. I like that right there. That's where we're going. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. Now, Brother Tracy, by the Spirit of God, said the Holy Ghost told him that 2024 will be a year of fill in the blank. It'll be a fill in the blank year. Which means 2024 will be a year of you fill in the blank. It's exact, God's going to do for you exactly what you say. That's the verse right there. You see what I'm saying here? Now, some of the best thing y'all can do is fill out, fill in the blank, blanks, <laughs> and compare a list. If you're married, compare a list. So you can tweak the list and go up higher, go bigger. Now, if you got a bestie, if you're not married, faith person, <laughs> y'all need to compare a list. You say, why? Because you want to you wanna tweak that list. You want maximum yield. You want to be thinking at your highest capacity. Now, we got some stuff on our list. But that sounds like the God of being, God of much, much more. It's a fill in the blank year. And God, like, now notice they came and said, we want you to do whatever we want. And Jesus didn't say, hold up, hold up now. Why are you talking to me like that? He didn't say that. He said, what you want me to do for you? So the title of my message tonight is, are the things of God automatic? Because some people think they, do, they are. They're in a church like this or any other church, and, they, and they're looking over into a watch night service. They, they say, we want to know what 2024 is going to be like. What is God going to do? And then the, the, the man of God or woman of God or whoever gets up and talks about what kind of year 2024 is going to be like, and people are shouting, they're screaming, they're hollering, they're running around, and then 2024 and December, you don't seem like they even heard what God says. You see? How can these things be if God's truly speaking, which I know he is, how can some people be left out? And the people I'm talking about being left out, I'm talking about Christians, his own kids that love him. How can any of us be left out? Because whatever you hear by grace has to be appropriated by faith. Now, appropriate is just a fancy word, means you got to lay hold of it. You got to take it to yourself as if, and as a matter of fact, let me give you the definition of the word appropriate right now. It means to take something for one's own use, to claim or use by an exclusive right. Now, one translation means to take it as if you're the only one he's speaking to, which means you got to make it personal. Like God said that to me. I don't care. Look, I heard what he said. He said it to me. Now, your mind is freaking out because your mind cannot comprehend 
the magnitude of what he said and what he's saying. Because your mind is finite. You see what I'm saying? And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the carnal mind or the fleshly mind cannot perceive the spiritual things that God is doing in our lives. So understand this. Your mind cannot comprehend or understand what I just said. You have to believe it in your heart. Because everybody in this room knows that what God said, 2024, be it a year, much, much more. You know that's the truth. You said, and, and you fact this, you, you should know that's the truth if you know God. Amen. God definitely wants to outdo what he did for you in 2023. Because right. he's a God of increase. He's not the God of decrease. He's not the God of subtraction. <laughs> he's a God of addition and multiplication. So we just know that by his own nature that he wants to do more for us in this year than what he did last year. Right? But God is specifically speaking. To, uh, how many men and women of God have said this is a year or more? It's a bunch of them. I mean, a bunch of them. As a matter of fact, I'm going I'm to play that on my phone real quick. I was going to show the video, but I don't have the video queued. So I'm going to play that on my phone. I don't know if, many, I don't know if you all watched the... Um, the uh, broadcast on uh, Sunday night where Brother Milton Johnson, he's an associate pastor of Pastor Eddie's church, and he visited Brother Tracy's church on December the 17th. And um, let me just find this real quick. Trying to remember what the name of the app is, and I just remembered it. Praise the Lord. Now, he's associate pastor of uh, Faith Family Church in uh, Jefferson, South Carolina. And he was instructed by the Spirit of God to go sow a seed into Brother Tracy's ministry on his way to Tulsa. Now, if you understand, it wasn't on the way, he had to go out the way. Thank you, Brother Justin. He had to go out the way to sow this seed. But then he delivered what the word of the Lord was that came to him on December the 17th. And this just, I'm just doing this as a demonstration to show to you, show you what um, God is doing and what he's speaking to the people. Um, I got to turn this up here. Let me exit out there. Let me pause just real quick. Are y'all ready? a seed and to put it in his hand so as the service was going on i found a place there toward the end of the service to um, actually put the seed in his hand and he asked me that i have anything for, for tithes and offerings and i said no so after the service um i shared with him what the Lord has spoken to me concerning uh, the year 2024. And the word of the Lord was this, that the year 2024 would be a year of plenty, plenty help and plenty resources. In 2024, I'll open the door. In 2024, you will not lack for the more. 2024 would be a year of the glory like never before, a year of victory, 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 and plenty, plenty, plenty for the harvest will manifest in the more. Glory. Praise God. That's powerful, isn't it? Thank you, brother. But that's powerful. That's just an example of what God is saying and doing in the body of Christ. And we got to get on board, and we are on board. Now, Let's go down to verse 46 through 52. Let's read that. And, these, and we're going to spend the rest of our time in these verses here. Now, are the things of God automatic? I like what Brother Kenneth Hagin used to say. He used to say, some Christians think that the things of God is going to fall in your lap like ripe cherries falling off a tree. <laughs> and because uh, we need to be taught. We, we really need to be taught about spiritual things. And we think, and we know God's all knowing, He's all powerful. And somehow in our minds, we think that God's just gonna do it and just make it happen for us because He's God. 
and not realize we have to work with God. Yeah. We're co-laborers with him. We're working with him. And so in their principles that we, you and I exercise that cause these things to manifest in our lives. Like, for example, just because Jesus went to the cross and died for every human on the planet, past, present, and future, doesn't guarantee that everybody's going to receive him. Did you get what I just said? Receive him. See, he did all he's going to do. Now you just have to receive what he did. Now, how do you receive that great gift, which is the greatest miracle? How do you receive that? First of all, you believe it. And how do we know you believe it? You'll have actions that prove what you say you believe. You will open up your mouth and you will actually receive it. And if you are sincere in your heart, the greatest miracle takes place that can take place in a human's life is the miracle of the new birth. And the Bible says if you are really sincere in your heart, you mean it in your heart, and you confess with your mouth, it says you were changed on the inside. And because you were changed on the inside, then you had actions that prove what you said out your mouth. It's called the new birth. It's called a new creature. Now, if you said that and we can't tell that you're new and you just your st old self on the outside, then you didn't mean that in your heart. See, see, when you start talking absolute like that, people say, well, how do you know what's in a person's heart? No, I am a fruit inspector. Jesus said, if a person believes in their heart and confess, there are two steps to receiving that miracle. Believing in your heart and confession. You make salvation, right? And so if you were really sincere, you would have the life that proves it. That's why now I learned this from Sister Carol. When she ministers to anyone about Jesus, she said, have you ever said that prayer? And if they will say yes, she'll say, well, you, you might have said that prayer, but if you hadn't had any notable change in your life, then maybe you didn't mean it. We can fix that right now. That's what she would say, something like on that line. Or so she would say something like, have you ever said that prayer one time in your life and there, there was an actual notable change in your life? And they said, well, because I've seen her do it before. She said, well, I've said that prayer before, but I don't know if anything ever changed. You see, that's what we're talking about here. We like to be word people. Yeah. Jesus was a fruit inspector. Jesus didn't let people fool him. <laughs> that's why the leaders are reading a book right now called Driven by Eternity, and it's heavy. It's weighty. It is. It's absolute. It's going by the scriptures. And see, Jesus was a man who came and delivered the word of God. He didn't put up with the stuff we put up in the world. He didn't fall for the okie doke. He didn't fall for false anointings. He knew what the real anointing was, do you? See, a lot of things can look hype. You, you know, people get caught up in names, and people, uh, we just found out, uh, I don't, I'm not mentioning any names, but we just found out that there's a minister, prominent minister, teaches a whole lot about grace, but doesn't have altar calls on purpose. So you don't need them. If I told you who it was in this room, you'd be shocked. But I'm not saying it on camera. You can come to me private and ask me. I'll tell you. See, there's a lot of foolishness going on in the body of Christ. But I believe a lot of that stuff is about to be uncovered. People are going to start collapsing. You're going to be like, hold up, I ain't no. Well, that's why we've been saying, leave your life according to the word. Now, Mark chapter 10 uh, verse 46, we're going to read about a guy named Bartimaeus that was blind. <laughs> you know, you don't say, we're going to blind Bartimaeus. No, he's not blind. I mean, you know, we're reading about this story. He was blind at this point, but he's not blind now. Let's read all the way to verse 52, and then we'll go back and comment on it. It says, and they came, I'm reading out of the King James Version, the easy read. I know y'all don't have that. They don't have that in digital form yet. Hoping they get it. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say to Jesus, You son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, You son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. 
And they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calls you. And he cast away his garment, rose, and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said to him, What will that you do? Uh, what will you that I should do to you? The blind man said to him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now, what I would like to do is if you would put that up in Amplified Classic and we'll comment out of it uh, from the Amplified Classic. Just go back up to verse 40, 46 and put it up on the screen. You would automatically think, well, if you, I mean, Jesus, don't you know? Mary, don't you know? Jesus, don't you know that if a blind man comes to you? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just waking y'all up a little bit. But anyway, <laughs> so you would think as a minister, man, woo-wee, it's a blind man coming, but I'm going to lay my hands on him to receive his sight. That's what we do, and that's wrong. You get you what I'm saying? We're training. This, this is a training session right now. We're learning on how not to operate as a minister of the gospel by assuming. We assume that somebody coming up limping in the healing line. We give a we give a altar call for healing. I'm gonna pray for that person that they don't limp anymore. Why? That might not be what they want. Now, come on now, come on now. Are, are we learning? We talked about this on the phone before, remember that? We just assume we go up to people in Walmart and we see problems and we say, I'm going to go lay my hands and then speak to that problem. And nothing happens. I wonder why. Because it might not be what they want. Are these things of God automatic? See, Jesus, did Jesus operate like that? Did he just assume? Now, there were times where he would operate by the, by the Holy Spirit in the divine way, like there was a funeral one time. And they were carrying this woman's young boy in a, in, a, in a coffin. And he just walked up into the coffin and said, arise. Now, he was just inspired by the Holy Ghost to do that. He didn't ask the mother anything. I mean, he just went up and did that. He did that with the man in the pool of Bethesda. He said, get up and take up your bed. And then Brother Hagin asked him about that. He said, I don't see where that man demonstrated faith when Jesus appeared to him. He said, I was inspired by the Holy Ghost just to do that. He said, but if you look in the four gospel, I would always ask the person, what do you want me to do for you? How did we miss that one? As tongue talking, power, wall to wall, Holy Ghost people that expect miracles. How did we miss that one? I tell you how we missed it. Not being a word person and being a person of spiritual understanding. I'm talking about including myself, you know? And so we see to be more effective, we have to do it the way the Bible says do it. But I'm just showing you a divine principle. Even though Jesus said what he said to us and others in the body of Christ, it's just not going to be automatic. It's not going to fall in our laps. We have to talk to him about it. We have to appropriate it. We have to lay hold on it. We have to, we have to think about it and imagine ourselves, you're the only one on the planet like Adam. All these resources are yours. He couldn't, he, there was nobody else around. You're going to have to imagine that. It's just you he's talking to, Right? Now, what's interesting, there's some principles here. Let's go back to verse 46 now. Now, notice they came to Jericho. Now, Jesus is leaving. So you got to picture the scene in your mind. Here's a, here's, here's, a, here's a blind man. He's begging. And I believe the, he was probably positioned maybe by the city gate, right? So he can pet, catch people coming in and leaving, right? Jesus had come into the city. And now he's leaving, and there's a big commotion going on, right? And then you got this guy, Bartimaeus, and say, what's going on? What's going on? And then he says, and then the Bible goes on to say this. Go to verse 2. I mean verse 2, verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, so Jesus did this as a man, which is powerful. Now, do you believe you're knowing it? I do. I don't get up been all, all been out of shape when, when I have altar calls and, and nothing happens. Because I know I'm prepared. But I know that the other person has to believe. See, I learned that now. That way I won't beat myself up. Because if you're beating yourself up, you think the power is of you. 
And I can show you in Jesus' ministry, everybody didn't get healed in Jesus' ministry. Now, there were times where you have a crusade and he healed them all, but not all the time. Sick people came to the meeting and left sick. Have y'all read this in the Bible? It's in Luke 5. He was in the house and the power of God was present. They healed them. But only one guy on the outside wasn't even in the meeting got healed. People came in the meeting sick and left the meeting sick. Why? Because they didn't appropriate it. Power of God's present. It's not gonna. It's not gonna heal your body because your sick body's in there. You gotta. You gotta operate by faith. And so, notice it says he heard that it was Jesus. Now, when he heard it was Jesus, look how he responded. He began to shout, "Jesus, Son of David, have pity or mercy on me." When he expected Jesus to respond. Not only then, but he expected his circumstance to change now. Do you expect it to change now? <laughs> I mean, come on. I'm not expecting it to change just in 2024. I'm expecting it to change now. <laughs> now is my receiving moment. Now, not, not five minutes from now. Not after the message is over. I'm receiving now. <laughs> Come on now, we got to be more radical in 2024. And I believe that's why the Holy Ghost said, minister on this before you go any further. Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to do all I can by the instruction of the Lord. Every meeting, Thursday and Sunday, I'm going to talk about the aspect of more. To where you can see it in the word, to where you can't, you can't afford not to think that God's not a God of more. Because you're going to see it all throughout the word. But here's the beginning step. Is everything that he said that's going to be automatic? No, we're going to have to apprehend it. We're going to have to be dogmatic. We're going to have to be like a bloodhound on the blood scent. We're going to have to be like a dog that's so hungry, you put this food in his bowl and you put your hand in it. He going to bite your hand off. I mean, that's how hungry we have to be. You understand what I'm saying? I'm hungry. I'm tired. Look. I've been, we've we, we been 24 years in marriage. That prophecy got to come online. I believe, I believe that prophecy was of God. He said it. He brought it up. Amen. Man, the amazing thing, I can't share that, huh? You want me to share it? No, because I, if I shared it, then it would be, it'll give it away. I can just tell you, she, she was there. I'm not making this up. I didn't know this person until, what, this is 2017. I didn't know this person until almost six, almost seven years ago. Until I didn't meet this person in, until 2017, right? And just recently just really came into a relationship with them, right? How could that person say what they said to us that was said to us almost 24 years ago, word for word verbatim? Am I telling you the truth? That one part of it. Holy Ghost. So obviously, the Holy Ghost is telling us, I want to do this now. Amen. And I know I'm not giving y'all details. I'm just trying to tell you, I'm God's serious about what he said. I'm telling you, you need to expect more. Amen. Well, I work on the job where they're not giving any raises. Look, promotion don't come from your boss. <laughs> it's a promotion comes from the north. God's the one sitting in the high seat. You control your own destiny with the words coming out of your mouth. Amen. Look, you, you, you need, if you need to say this, say this. You know, they said, you know, God, they said that I, nobody getting raises on my job this year. <laughs> Woo! That is funny, isn't that, God? <laughs> to think that he's a boss unto himself. You know you his boss. You know it and I know it. That's how you need to talk. That's how you need to think. So I don't know about anybody else, but I know I'm getting me a raise. I know I'm getting promoted. I mean, that's how you have to talk. That's how you have to think. Now, because we know what the increase is for. What is it? To get us over into the position of harvest. Increase don't come so you can buy a boat, so you can buy a bigger house. Now, I mean, I'm not saying you can't do this thing. I'm telling you the purpose of the increase. I'm talking about Deuteronomy 8.18. Remember, it is I'm the Lord your God that gives you the ability to obtain wealth. So my covenant be established. I didn't say you can't go buy a boat or buy a house. That's not what I said. You got to think about, you got to hear what I said in context. I'm telling my believers when they get the increase, you sit, really see what's in their heart. 
Because increase should come with instructions. Meaning when the increase comes, you should pause and say, Lord, I know what I want to do, but what do you want me to do? You see what I'm saying? And I'm telling you, if you hadn't developed that level of thinking on the inside of you, you're going to shortchange yourself when that increase is coming. You're going to disqualify yourself. Because that's how heaven thinks. Heaven doesn't think, think about it. Heaven doesn't think about, man, I'm going to give so-and-so a million dollars so I can buy a million dollar house. Why? Because that million dollar house will destroy them if that's all they're thinking the increase is for. See, I need a bigger house. Let me tell you why I need a bigger house. This is why I need a bigger house. Because of the assignment on my life. Because it's in my heart to host ministers. I got I to gotta have that guest quarters. I got to have that set up to where, I mean, I really want to do this. It's not lip service to me, right? So I want ministers to be able to stay in my house. And then I want to position myself. I've gotten to the place. You're going to hear it for the first time. I've gotten to, I got myself to, this, to the place where I agree that could be a brother or sister in need, and if I have the means to house them till they get on their feet, I'm going to do that. Because that's part of my command, commission as a, as a bishop. It says be hospitable. And that's just not lip service. I got I to gotta have that. I can't do that right now in the position I'm in. I'm, I, I got I to be able to do it. Got to be able to do it. And then, and then I'm going to benefit from the anointings being in my house. Now, you ain't going to the hotel. You're staying in my house. I'm going to host the anointing. Yeah. Do you think like that? Or do you think, oh, I don't want that person in my house to see what I got? Well, first of all, what do you have in your house <laughs> that God didn't give you? <laughs> that's wrong. I'm telling you, that's wrong thinking. They need to see what you have to increase their capacity to receive what, some of the things that you have. See, our focus and our thinking is not thinking like heaven sometimes. We just think it's too carnal. We think that stuff is really ours, right? And I got to have that for that purpose. But then it's people get bigger in my house. <laughs> Let's be real. I got to have more square footage. I just do. Look, if all this stuff is going to burn up and perish with the using of them, why shouldn't I use it? Why should a sinner use it to host demonic parties and you know, orgy parties and all that other kind of stuff, drug parties to do all kinds of sin. But here I am, I want to have Holy Ghost parties where people just come to my house, get blessed and so full of joy and peace and say, man, I love being at pastor's house. I just felt so good. It's just, I, I, I'm changed. Just something happened. And you, you, that'll be your home because as an abode, God should live there. You should desire that. God's not a God of El Shaco. El Shaddai, the God of more than enough, the all-breasty one. Look, you already live in a big house. Just get a smaller one. Did you get what I just said? You already live in the household of faith. God's in the Jesus said, in my father's house are many dwellings. You're in the father's house right now. He got a big house. I'm in the big house. So what's 5,000 square feet? Compared to his. Look like one square foot. Well, you don't know the amount of electricity and bills and electricity. That's not my concern. Or it shouldn't be. Be like that time Bill Winston was telling that story about this guy built this massive house and he he wanted to he had been trying to get a hold of him and he got finally got a hold to him and told him uh, where he lived and gave him the address and he'd say he drove there and saw this big fountain when he's driving down the long driveway and he saw this magnificent fountain and saw this huge home and went inside and he's looking and said, man, them ceilings were high. Because <laughs> he said he was thinking all kind of thoughts, man, I wonder how he cleaned them ceilings. <laughs> they so high. <laughs> you know, you know, you think stuff like that. You go in some of these houses, you see some of these houses, you know. He's thinking about all that and the, and the guy ended up telling him the reason why I invited him over. He said, I thought I built this house for me. He said, but I, the Lord told me, you didn't build this house uh, for you. you built it, I built it for you. And I want to sign the title deed over to you right now. And he said, the guy choked. And this is what he said. 
See, this is why this is why I said earlier that when that increase comes, the weight of it is going to expose what's really in your heart. See, money doesn't make you live a better quality of life. It enhances who you are already. That's what it does. If you do a bunch of wrong things with money now, how many wrong things will you do when you get a bunch? Many wrong things. Right? And so this guy said, uh, can I ask you a question? What are the cost of your utilities a month? See, he choked. Now, now he, you say, how did he choke? Now, if God can give you this house debt-free, you mean to tell me God can't pay the utilities? Because the utilities are a whole lot less than the cost of the home. But that's where some of us are right now in our faith. We're thinking, man, how can God do this? How do that? I'm telling you how he's going to do it. He's able to do a super singular above what you can think as dream of according to the power. So if you can think on another level, that's how you advance. Some of you right now are living at a more capacity than you were five years ago. Some of you are giving more than what you gave two years, three years ago. How did you get there? You're thinking. It's not just the amount. You got there with your thinking. Because I know some people get the amount, but they can't. I can't. I don't believe I can do that. Like business owners get blessed and they don't think they can tithe. That ain't lined up with the book. You understand what I'm saying? People don't do things that they don't think they can do. But if your capacity in your thought life changes, then you can do it. That's how you grow. That's actually how you grow in the things of God. You cannot grow outside of your thought life. That's how God operates. And that's why it's just not going to fall in your life. There's no power just, just going to overwhelm you to where you just blow up. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Now, you're going to have to let the power of God work in your mind to think on a whole different level. That's where the word is, where it comes. That's why the word is so important to, to look at. And then listen to the Holy Spirit. He's trying to increase our capacity by increasing our thought life. Right? Now, so now, he starts screaming, yelling, Jesus, son of David. Now, this is interesting to point out. What is he yelling? He is yelling a revelatory thing. A lot of people don't know who Jesus is. And we know this from Matthew 16. Who do men say that I am? And some say you just wanted the anointed prophets, right? And then when Peter got the revelation of who he was, guess what was handed to him? Keys. So how did he receive the keys? By revelation. So how is this man positioning himself to receive? He's speaking to Jesus or yelling out to him based on what is revealed to him. No different that you're just going to have to let this not just be just a word that 2024 is going to be a year much, much more. You're going to have to hear it with a revelation and said, I believe that to be so. And then start crying out to God based on that revelation. Because that's what this man is doing. And so go to the next verse here. And merely severely censored and reproved him. That's a lot of that going on today. Censorship. That's the devil. The devil is trying to prevent you from receiving from God. I ain't, I'm not allowing myself to be muzzled. Only thing that should be muzzled is demons. When Jesus says shut up, it says be muzzled. That's what it means in the Greek. Like you know you muzzle a greyhound, you muzzle a demon, tell him to shut up. He don't have a right to talk. But notice it says, and many, how many? Many will try to talk you out of this. This is not real. Your circumstance is not, train, uh, not, not changed. Shut up. Nothing's changing for you. Just stop talking. Stop crying out to God. Stop praying. Stop going to church. Telling him to keep still or to be quiet. But when this happened, but he kept on shouting out all the more. You son of David. Have pity and mercy on me now. 
And Jesus stopped. The fact that the Bible says he stopped lets us know he would have kept going. Now, come on now. He stopped when? When he was serious about his crying out to God. But notice he didn't cry at one time. The more he had that temptation to shut up, yeah. he cried out the more. And sometimes you're going to feel like that. You're not going to feel like praying. You're not going to feel like crying out to God. You're not going to feel like. And see, we're not really saying this for God's benefit. We're saying it for our benefit. And we want the devil to hear us. Right? But notice, Jesus, he's already yelling. And you know Jesus heard that faint cry in the distance. Come on now, he's a man. He just kept on this guy yelling my name. I'm going to keep walking. That's what he's doing. He's walking. And they told him, shut up, be quiet. And he kept saying, Jesus, you son of David, have mercy on me now. And he got louder, the Greek says. And Jesus stopped and said, man, call that guy to me. Will you get Jesus to stop this year? Or is he going to keep going? Or is he going to keep passing you by? He ain't passing me by, not this year. He's going to have to stop at my house, 6806 Haley Court. I'm going to say, don't say your address on the, on the, on the line. But come on now, it's all, it's all on social media. <laughs> And I'm not scared. I mean, come on now. He gonna have to stop at my house. See, see, y'all, y'all got, in the, y'all got in the flesh. He don't say your address online. Look here, you can Google my name on Google. All my information come up. It does. I'm not making that up. All right, I look over there and say, yeah, it does. That's why I can't be out there acting a fool. Anyway, you can see the night. It's out there. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man telling him, take courage. Now, the same folks was telling him to shut up and say, now, be a good courage. You know, he's calling for you. Get up. He's calling you. Now they're talking right, you know. Get up. He is calling you. Now, notice this. He threw off his outer garment. Now, beggars... They would give them a special coat. It was like a license. Like, you know, you go to the city and you, you have to get a license to pass out food now. You know, <laughs> which is crazy. But anyway, you got to get a license to do the gospel, huh? But anyway, in the day Jesus lived in, you had to qualify to sit in certain places to be able to beg. You just couldn't do this because you, you were poor. You had to have a garment that signified who you were in society. And so he was identified with this beggar's coat. And so he's a beggar. And why is he a beggar? Because he can't see. He can't can't do things the way he should be able to do them in that that society, right? And so now, look, he says, Jesus is calling you. But this is an important part right here. We're talking about, are these things automatic? Look at his response. He didn't go to Jesus with that coat on. Some people overlook that. Because if he would have went to Jesus with that coat on, he's having doubts. I'm going to keep this coat on in case it don't work. (laughs) He didn't do that. The Bible says, I like the Greek says, he threw that coat away. Never to pick it up again. There's no doubt in his mind and his heart that he's going to receive from God. Why? Because he called for him. So he just threw that garment away. He didn't wrap it up as a souvenir to take it home. Nope. It says he threw out his outer garment. Then notice he leaped up. And I like that. It didn't say he stood up. I think the King James said he jumped up, meaning he was prompt. There was a window. And I'm telling you, we're going to have to learn this. There, God moves in windows like there's opportunities. That's what the word opportunity means, meaning like a window, a moment in time, and you can't be lazy about it. You're going to have to be prompt to obey God. And that explains what it is. He jumped up. He said he calling for me. Oh, he is? Like if I give an altar call, don't be. 
You say, why? Because it demonstrates your attitude towards God in receiving something from him. Think about it. This, see, some people are so conscious of themselves. Like if I say I'm doing an altar call for healing, healing of backs, first thing y'all start doing is looking around see if anybody else got back problems. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Y'all start looking around in the room, see if anybody else got back problems, and see who's going to go up first. Because that makes you feel comfortable going up there so you won't be the first one. That's how a lot of people are. But that's why people don't, I'm telling you, that's why one of the reasons why people don't receive. You got to hear that command as if you're the only one he's speaking to. Who cares about anybody else in the room? If you got back issues, you better be jumping up and running. That's me, Pastor. That's me, Pastor. And to the point, people say, man, they ready to receive. Y'all know what I'm talking about is the truth. I used to do that stuff, too, looking around, see if anybody else going to respond to the call. And four people go up and say, now I feel comfortable. I'm going to go ahead and go down <laughs> since I'm not the only one. But I'm telling you that was wrong. You, didn't, you might not know that it was wrong. But because you, you didn't realize that's called slow of heart, slow to believe. Remember, believing is just not an attitude. And thing. It is a response. It's an action. You're slow to believe. And Jesus brought one and brought it up. He said this generation is slow to believe. Now, the Bible says he jumped up and he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Did you know he had an option? He could have said, I want a better paying job. <laughs> I mean, come on now, because he's begging. Or he could at least add, he could have said, I don't want to be a beggar anymore. He wouldn't have received the sight. He would have been blind, non-begging Bartimaeus. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on now, but he still would have been blind. Come on now, because we got realize, to realize heaven operates like this. We have to be specific. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? So that lets us know that the name of Jesus can only do for us, Sister Cor, what we wanted to do for us. Does that make sense? You see this clearly in the word. We're going to have to be people who are going to dare, Sister Andre, to put that in the blank. <laughs> I told Tanasi, man, she said, let's do our list. So we, on Monday, I think Tuesday, we did our list. And I told her, I said, man, I feel like Paul. I now understand what that means in 1 Corinthians. Where he said, I came to you fear and trembling. He wasn't afraid. He was talking about the awesomeness of God. You know the power is there. You know he's, da he's daring you to ask and you're trembling. <laughs> man, I'm about to write that on the list. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Because once I've written it, it is written. Someone said, if the vision that God has given you, if you can achieve that in your lifetime, then that vision didn't come from God. And we know that's true. Because what he spoke to Abram in Genesis 12, which is the father of our faith, there's no way he could have walked that out in his lifetime. But notice the vision that he told him was carried out through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jesus, and us. It's still going on. The vision of God. Now, he'll let you do glimpses of it. But you say, why bring that up? If God told you to put a monetary figure in that blank, why would you only put 500000 Oh, let's just be real. Let's, 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 let's hit everybody in the room. Why would you only put $5 million? Especially if you believe the Bible. That fathers... Leave an inheritance. I'm about to say it now. Didn't say your children. See, most people quote that wrong. And some people think that God's saying, don't leave an inheritance for your children. That's not what he's saying. But he's trying to show you how blessed you should be. It says, Father should leave an inheritance to his children's children. 
Go look at how many generations that is. It means you should so be so blessed that before your kids start having children, they already have their inheritance in place. That's the context. Now, how blessed do you need to be? I'm talking about what dollar bills. I'm talking about monetary value. How much do you need or should you have in your possession to carry out that mandate? See, it's going to require some thinking, huh? You just can't loosely put, put that in the blank. You have to get with your wife or uh, uh, whoever and consult the Holy Ghost and say, is, is, is a billion enough? <laughs> I'm messing with some people right now. <laughs> because, I mean, think about it. Why, why are people in the world billionaires? Why not us? And then have a will in place and how to administrate all that will. So you got people in the world saying, I ain't leaving mine here to my kids. They're going to learn how to work for it. Do you know that's not, a, that's not scriptural? Did you know that's not scriptural? Can we talk about some stuff in here? I'm, whether you realize it or not, I got my torch out. And I'm helping you in your mind in some areas that you've even thought and said out of your mouth. Her other sinners say, well, I'm not leaving my kids because they got to have to work. And some of y'all say, yeah, they got to work hard. They got to work hard like this. You wrong. You ought to be ashamed of yourself thinking that. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and toil does not add to it. We talk about him blessing us. We not working for it. So how dare us get on the same bandwagon and say, yeah, make them work. They would, just don't give them something. They'd be spoiled. God didn't think so. Only reason why he brought up a spoiled child is says when you don't correct them. Isn't that what he said? He said, you spare the raw, you spoil the child. The word spoil means you ruin them. So spoiled kids are kids that are not disciplined. But we use that out of context. We'll say if a kid, you know, grows up in the house to where things are given to them, they ne never had to go to work, their parents just bought them a Beamer or a Mercedes, they just some spoiled brats. You're, 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 you're not speaking Bible terms correctly. What you should say is they're unthankful. That's what you should be saying. They're unthankful. They were not taught to be thankful for all things. That's what the Bible tells us. So it's nothing wrong with blessing your kids. You tell them to be thankful, and you tell them where every good and perfect gift came from. So they can be thankful, so they can, and you tell them the principles about stewardship and how to be blessed to be a blessing. Does that make sense to what I just said? Yeah. I'm, that, that's, 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 that's part of what the Holy Ghost said. We've got to tweak the way we've been thinking because really we've been cutting off our own increase with that kind of thinking. Because we had that conversation. Said so that was the wrong thinking. You're going to leave your kids to the wolves. Anyway, all right. He leaped up, jumped up, and came to Jesus. And Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. That's powerful, isn't it? And Jesus said to him, Go your way. He didn't even lay hands on him. Go your way. Your what has made you whole? Your faith. Now let's translate faith. Faith is what he did. When they told him to shut up, he said, nope. <laughs> when they said, be quiet, he said, nope. I'm going to be louder. When they said shut up, I'm going to talk more. Because there's no such thing as operating by faith and your mouth's not moving in the right direction. Because remember, James said, your words will take, take control of your whole body. So when he's crying out to Jesus, he's setting his whole self up to come to Jesus and to walk in his destiny. And so... Jesus said, your faith has healed you or made you whole, like what King James said, made you whole. Let's look at this one more time before we leave. He hears something. Man, what's going on? What's all this commotion about? Jesus is leaving out of the city. Oh, that Jesus? Jesus! Jesus! 
Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, shut up. You don't take all that. Just be quiet. Be quiet in the meeting. Pastor preaching. But there's sometimes when I'm preaching, some people get a revelation that you can't keep them quiet because they heard something. Matter of fact, I'm looking for the day when I have meetings like that. I'm believing God for meetings like that. I read in a meeting one day. Matter of fact, I had a meeting like that in, in July. I had to stop preaching because people was yelling and screaming. Somebody said it. I, it tripped me out because I was believing God for that. You see, you believe God for that? Yeah, I was. You said, you, you, and the one just about shouting because I read about a man who used to preach, and when, as soon as he started preaching, people just started falling out of, of the power. And so I got to meditating on that. I said, I want to be like that. That when I'm preaching, man, the power of God is just so, just so, just permeating the atmosphere that while I'm ministering underneath that anointing, that people can't remain the same. And so this guy, this minister used to have meetings and he used to climb up in the trees and say, hey, 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 y'all get off them trees before I start preaching. He had to instruct them to get off the trees. Because the moment he started preaching, the power of God started hitting, they started falling out of the trees. And then sometimes he'll preach that anointing will come on there, fall on the power, or they'll shake control, and they'll, or they'll just start crying out to God for the answer. And it'll happen in the meetings while he's preaching. We need some more of that today yeah. as a demonstration of the power of God. And so I was believe, meditating on that when I was in Indiana. You didn't know that. I was meditating on that. And it happened in the meeting. It tripped me out. And I, I had to stop. You saw I had to stop. I saw, you saw my face like, man, this is crazy. It's happening. I said, you get what you meditate on. <laughs> but anyway, the bottom line is, let's look at this. This is so simple. It's Jesus coming by, and he just cries out to Jesus. They told him to shut up. He said, no, I ain't shutting up. I'm going to cry louder. To the point where Jesus had to stop. Do you believe you can cry out to the point where Jesus had to stop at your house? Now, I know he's already in. I'm talking about the spiritual principle now that he's going to have to give you some attention. To the point he's going to ask you the question, what do you want? you got to look at it like this. Sometimes we just think, Jesus, I like what it said, Jesus of Nazareth is coming by. He's a minister. He's operating as a minister. But he's carrying something. God's ministers carry things. It's going to, this is how you're going to have to operate to receive from God. You're going to have to recognize God-anointed ministers. That's how he transfers his goods and services. Many times. So Jesus is operating as a minister. So Bartimaeus comes to this minister. But this person doesn't recognize who Jesus really is. But remember, he's operating as a man anointed by the Spirit. It's important to understand that. And then the minister asked him, what do you want me to do for you? How could he ask that? He couldn't have asked that question to blind, uh, to Bartim blind Bartimaeus at that time unless he knew what he was carrying. Did you hear what I just said? Jesus knew what he was carrying. And he knew that he was carrying simply the anointing that can make all things possible to those that would dare to believe. And I'm telling you by the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to start operating like that out there. When people come to you you're going to have to be just as bold. Do you, think I, do you believe I can do this for you? Some of y'all looking at me like, man, what do you mean? That's a different way of thinking. We know it's Jesus doing it, but remember he anointed you to do the same thing he's doing and to operate the same way he's operating. So you're going to have to believe and trust in the anointing that he placed on your life. Matter of fact, I'm, I, I endeavor this year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice that more. You say, why? Because I want more of what I see in the Bible. I'm going to just do what he did. Do you believe when I lay my hands on you, healing power is going to hit your body? You see what I'm saying? Not just simply come up here and just lift your hands up. No, we have to engage people on a whole different level so they can receive. Right? So Jesus said, do you believe I'm able to do this? And he said, yes. And then Jesus just simply gave him the command. Why he didn't lay his hands? Because the Holy Ghost didn't tell him to lay his hands. See, that's, what's, that's the part you're going to have to receive from the Holy Ghost. He'll let you know what to do at that moment, whether to don't lay hands on them or lay hands on them or tell them to jump up or jump up and down or run two laps in the sanctuary. He'll tell you what to do. 
That's why it's the Holy Ghost. I mean, you haven't noticed, uh, uh, Sister Sharon, that when it talks about the power of God and the gifts of the Spirit, it doesn't go into uh, specific detail on how to administrate the Holy Ghost. This is the reason why. Because you have to have a relationship with him for you to know what he wants to do. I mean, like Smith Woodward, just punch that woman in the stomach, her tumor will disappear. Well, you got to have enough relationship with the Holy Ghost to punch a woman in the stomach, especially if she's married in the service. Because the meeting going to go a different way. <laughs> I mean, you see what I'm saying? And people are scared to do those things, but the reason why people are scared to do those things is because you hadn't developed a relationship with the Holy Spirit. But when you develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you know him, and that unction's in you, you're just going to do it. Right? And so when he did that, the Bible says, your faith has healed you. So he said something, and he acted on what he said, and he just simply received. So this year, they're just not going to fall into our laps. The God of more, uh, much, much more, these things, and uh, the things we're going to talk about as we progress along, they're just not going to fall in our lap. We're going to appropriate them. We're going we're gonna to say, no, this is exclusive to me. God's talking to me. I mean, it's like this, like this, like here's one right here that I mentioned before. When he, when he did that trace for me on God of being much, much more, the Bible says God killed more of the Amorites with hailstones than Joshua did with the edge of the sword, right? But then there were five kings that were coming against Joshua. Right? And the Bible says those kings ran and, 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 and ran into a cave. And Joshua found out about it. He said, put the rock over that cave so they can't escape. Right? And so he went out and defeated all I mean, y'all read the story. And so he said he, he went out and defeated all the Amorites, and then he went and dealt with the kings. And then he got all the people of Israel. He said, y'all come here. Y'all come here. Y'all come here. Put your foot on their neck. You ever read that sister? You know what I'm talking about? He said, put your foot on, the neck, on their necks. So shall God do to every one of your enemies. And so, and so when I read that, I was like, yeah, God, every one of my enemies in 2024, you're going to cut off that oxygen supply so they can't live any longer in my life. I'm going to put my foot on every neck of any, every one of my your, The neck of your enemy might be cancer. But it's not going to happen to you unless you talk like that. You have to say, God in 2024 is, is going to allow me to put my foot on the necks of every one of my enemies. I'm going to utterly cut off their oxygen supply. I'm going to cut their heads off and I'm going to hang them on a tree as a display and say, shall, so shall God do to every one of your enemies. But it has to become an enemy. You can't pet that thing. You can't say, my migraines, my headaches. Because it's not an enemy if it's yours. That's right. <laughs> Think about it. You can't, you got who gave it to you? I mean, come on now, that's an enemy. All sickness, poverty, and lack is an enemy. Not having enough when it's supposed to have some, uh, enough, that's, right. that's an enemy. That's right. He's putting my foot on their necks. Cut off their oxygen supply, amen? Father, we thank you for the word this evening. Father, we thank you, thank you for revelation knowledge. Father, we thank you that you're going to cause us in 2024 to put our feet on the necks of every one of our enemies. You will utterly destroy every one of them. That's a covenant promise. You said that you will be an enemy to our enemies. But Father, we cooperate with you. We work with you. Our words are not going to be stout against you. We say out of our mouths, 2024 is our year for more. And we're going to start filling in the blank. And we're going to think big. Ask big. Dream big. Hope big. And even dare to put some things on there to see you show up and show out in our lives. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. What did you receive this evening? Amen. Those that are watching us, I want you to remember, you are who God says you are.